Order, please. Before we begin with the daily routine, I'd like to make a, a speaker's statement. Honorable members, today marks the first sitting of the House since, our, since the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, the Queen of Canada, on September 8th. Before the passing of Her Late Majesty, we had been in the midst of the Platinum Jubilee celebrations, marking the 70th anniversary of her accession to the throne on February 6, 2022. This summer, an exhibit staged here at Province House highlighted the several royal tours undertaken by Her Late Majesty in this province, including two visits to Province House. In her visit in 1994, our late Queen unveiled a plaque designating Province House a National Historic Site. The Crown plays an integral role in the Nova Scotia's parliamentary democracy. The Legislature comprises this House of Assembly and the Lieutenant Governor, who acts as the representative of the Crown in this province. Before a bill is passed by this Assembly and becomes law, it must receive royal assent from the Lieutenant Governor. For the last 70 years, we've seen that process play out at the end of each sitting when the Lieutenant Governor would arrive and on being presented with the bill, state, in Her Majesty's name, I assent to these bills. Henceforth, His Honour will be granting royal assent in the name of His Majesty the King. Last month, I wrote to our new sovereign, His, His Majesty King Charles III, to convey to him and the royal family the sincere condolences of the members of this House. Her late majesty will long be remembered in this province with respect and affection for her long life of dedicated service. May she rest in peace. With that said, I ask that you rise for a moment of silence in honour of Her late majesty. God save the King. <coughs> we'll begin with the daily routine. Presenting and reading petitions. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to table a petition with the operative clause reading as follows. We respectfully request that the House of Assembly of Nova Scotia make the wage increase for early childhood educators an immediate priority and backdate a wage increase for those already in the profession to January 2022, while also giving a date as to when this wage increase will happen. Mr. So Speaker, we know the, that wage increase has been given and announced this week. There are 97 names on this petition, and I've affixed my signature as well. The petition is tabled. Presenting reports of committees. Tabling reports, regulations, and other papers. Statements by ministers. Government notices of motion. The Honourable, the Honourable Premier. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day, I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Be it resolved, one, that a humble address to His Majesty the King in the following words do pass. To the King's most excellent Majesty, most gracious Sovereign, we, Your Majesty's dutiful and loyal subjects, the representatives of the people of Nova Scotia in General Assembly, respectfully express our deep sympathy and heartfelt sorrow for the great loss sustained by Your Majesty in the passing of your beloved mother, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada. We mourn the loss of our Queen with you. 
with the members of the royal family and with the people of all Your Majesty's realms. Her late Majesty's dedication to her duties as sovereign, her selfless commitment to public service and her dignified manner have earned her the loyalty and respect of the people of Nova Scotia. We warmly recall the tours of our province by Her Late Majesty, accompanied by His Late Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, in 1951, 1959, 1976, 1994, and 2010, including visits to Historic Province House uh, Legislative Building in which this House of Assembly convenes. Her Late Majesty will be remembered by Nova Scotians with great affection and admiration. We respectfully welcome Your Majesty's accession to the throne as King of Canada and offer our loyalty and devotion. As Your Majesty undertakes the heavy responsibilities of a sovereign, we share with you our conviction that Your Majesty, with the support of Her Majesty the Queen Consort, will strive to promote the happiness of the people in all your realms and to advance the cause of peace and justice now and in the years to come. Two, and that the above humble address to His Majesty the King be engrossed and presented to His Honour, the Lieutenant Governor, with the request that the address so engrossed be transmitted through the proper channels to His Majesty. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. But all those in favour of the motion, please indicate aye. Aye. Contrary mind it nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Be it resolved that, in addition to the Honourable Member for Preston, the Honourable Member for the Halifax Citadel Sable Island, the Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's, the Honourable Member for Eastern Shore, and the Honourable Member for Shelburne be the chairs of committees and deputy speakers of the House of Assembly. Two, the Honourable Member for Eastern Shore be the deputy speaker within the meaning of subsection 14.3 of the House of Assembly Act and within the meaning of the House of Assembly Management Act. And three, the annual salary of the deputy speaker established pursuant to the House of Assembly Act be divided equally between the five chairs of committees and deputy speakers. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. No. No. I hear several no's. The motion is tabled. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I'm about to read a motion which pertains to, not, to gender neutral language for the uh, rule book for the legislature. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Be it resolved that the rules and forms of procedure of the House of Assembly are amended in accordance with the attached schedule. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. But all those in favour of the motion show your consent by saying aye. Aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, this one is a bit longer, so I will ask members for their patience on this one. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Be it resolved that the rules and forms of procedure of the House of Assembly be amended as follows. Paragraph 1 of Rule 6 is amended by adding physical or virtual immediately after the. Rule 6 is further amended by adding immediately after paragraph 1 the following paragraph. 1A, notwithstanding paragraph 1, the physical presence of the Speaker, the Deputy Speaker, or another member presiding over the House shall be necessary to constitute a meeting of the House. Paragraph 4 of Rule 6 is amended by striking out come in and substitu substituting join the proceedings. Paragraph 6 of Rule 6 is amended by adding in person or virtually immediately after present, everywhere it appears. Rule 6b is amended by adding immediately after paragraph H the following paragraph. A member shall be physically present in the House to vote. The rules are further amended by adding immediately after Rule 1-4 the following heading and rule. I guess it's 14a-1. A member may attend the services of the House, including the Committee of the Whole or the Subcommittee on Supply, virtually, with leave of the Speaker, 
if the member advises the speaker that the member has good cause to prevent the member from appearing in person. 14A2, where a member attends the House virtually, the member, A, shall do so from a location within Nova Scotia, using such video conference software or other medium as may be directed by the speaker. And 14A2B, may only participate and be counted as present for the purpose of establishing quorum if the member's face is clearly visible on the video or other medium. 14A3, where a member attends the House virtually, the member may indicate the member's desire to be recognized in such manner as may be directed by the Speaker. 14A3B, for the purpose of Rules 22, 47, 59 and 63, the member is deemed to have risen in the member's place once the member is recognized by the Speaker. And 14A3C, for the purpose of paragraphs 7 and 8 of Rule 43, the member is not required to rise in the member's place to be counted as supporting a motion for leave under that rule, but may indicate the member's support and be counted in such manner as may be directed by the Speaker. 14A4, where a member attending the House virtually seeks or is required to table a document in the House, the member shall do so in such manner as the Speaker may direct or have another member physically present in the House table the document on behalf of the member attending virtually. 7. Rule 28 is amended by adding immediately after paragraph 4 the following paragraph, which will be paragraph 5. When a member attending the House virtually has been suspended pursuant to this rule from the service of the House, the Speaker shall direct the member to exit the virtual proceedings, and if the member shall refuse to obey the direction of the Speaker, the Speaker shall then order the member to be removed from the video conference or other medium of virtual participation. That may be more relevant to some members than others in here, Mr. Speaker, but of course I leave that to your judgment. <laughs> Uh, 8. Paragraph 2 of Rule 38 is amended by striking out voices and substituting votes. 9. Rule 38 is further amended by adding immediately after paragraph 2 the following paragraphs. 2A. A member attending the House in person shall declare the member's vote in the affirmative or in the negative verbally. 2B. A member attending the House virtually shall declare the member's vote in the affirmative or in the negative by such manner as the Speaker may direct. 10. Rule 38 is further amended by adding, immediately after paragraph 3, the following paragraph. 3A. A member in virtual attendance may make a demand pursuant to paragraph 3 in such manner as the Speaker may direct. 11. Paragraph 1 of Rule 44 is amended by striking out printed and substituting published. 12. Rule 45 is amended by a, striking out printed and distributed to the members and substituting published on the legislature's website. And 12B, striking out printed and substituting published. And 12C, striking out, signifying that it has been printed and distributed. 13. Rule 48 is amended by adding or the clerk of the committee immediately after referred. 14. Rule 49 is amended by a, striking out reprinted everywhere it appears and substituting republished. B, adding publish immediately after print. Striking out C, striking out printed and substituting published. And D, striking out and distributed and substituting on the legislature's website. 15. Paragraph 1 of Rule 62 DA is amended by striking out nine members constitute and substituting the physical or virtual presence of nine members constitutes. 16. Paragraph 1 of Rule 62F is, is amended by striking out six members constitute and substituting the physical or virtual presence of six members constitutes. 17. Paragraph 3 of Rule 62F is amended by A, striking out voices wherever it appears and substituting votes, and B, striking out voice and substituting vote. 18. Paragraph 4 of Rule 62F is amended by adding broadcast on television or streamed on the internet immediately after public. 19. Rule 62FB is amended by striking out have one or two support staff 
and substituting appear either virtually or in person and be accompanied by one or two support staff who may be. And finally, 20, Rule 77 is amended by A, adding, cause the orders of the day to be sent electronically to all members and immediately after shall the first time it appears. And 20B, striking out at each member's place and substituting the place of each member in physical attendance. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. <laughs> The motion is tabled, and we'll, we should ask the minister to read it again in Gaelic. <laughs> Nobody else. Introduction of bills. The Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture, and what else? African Nova Scotian Affairs. There we go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to uh, introduce a bill, an act to amend Chapter 22 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia Act. The Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture, Tourism and Heritage and African Nova Scotian Affairs begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 22 of the Revised Statutes, 1989, the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia Act. Bill 196, An Act to Amend Chapter 22 of the Revised Statutes, 1989, the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia Act. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Preston to table a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 203 of the Revised Statutes, 1989, the Homes for Special Care Act, respecting power outages in long-term care. The Honourable Member for Preston begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 203 of the Revised Statutes, 1989, the Homes for Special Care Act respecting power outages in long-term care. Bill 197, An Act to Amend Chapter 203 of the Revised Statutes, 1989, the Homes for Special Care Act respecting power outages in long-term care. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Minister of Housing and Municipal Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 4 of the Acts of 1992, the Emergency 911 Act, and the Chapter, chapter 8 of the Acts of 1990, the Emergency Management Act. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 4 of the Acts of 1992, the Emergency 911 Act, and Chapter 8 of the Acts of 1990, the Emergency Management Act. Bill 198, An Act to Amend Chapter 4 of the Acts of 1992, the Emergency 911 Act, and Chapter 8 of the Acts of 1990, the Emergency Management Act. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Annapolis. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill named An Act to Create the Hurricane Fiona Salvage Assistance Program. The Honourable Member for Annapolis begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Create the Hurricane Fiona Salvage Assistance Program. Bill 199, An Act to Create the Hurricane Fiona Salvage Assistance Program. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable, the Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture, Tourism and Heritage and African Nova Scotian Affairs. 
Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to uh, introduce a bill entitled an act to amend Chapter 7 of the Acts of 2019, the Nova Scotia Museum Act. The Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture, Tourism and Heritage begs leave to introduce a bill entitled an act to amend Chapter 7 of the Acts of 2019, the Nova Scotia Museum Act. Bill 200, an act to amend Chapter 7 of the Acts of 2019, the Nova Scotia Museum Act. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth Cole Harbour. Cole Harbour, Dartmouth. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Require Backup Power at Petrol Stations. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Dartmouth begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Require Backup Power at Petrol Stations. Bill 201, an act to require backup power at petrol stations. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Dartmouth. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Create a Registry of Vulnerable Persons. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Dartmouth begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Create a Registry of Vulnerable Persons. Bill 202, An Act to Create a Registry of Vulnerable Persons. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. <laughs> Notices of Motion. Statements by members. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize a heartwarming instance of community action that recently took place in Springville. It was 5 p.m. on September the 24th when four-year-old Grady McKinnon disappeared from his backyard. His parents, Jillian and Adam, and his older sister, Harper, searched everywhere to no avail. It was the day after Hurricane Fiona hit our province when so many people were in need, but the McKinnon family was in desperate need of help. Mr. Speaker, the community showed up for Grady. Within an hour, over 150 people, including first responders, neighbours, friends and strangers, were searching the nearby woods, an environment that Jillian described as pitch black jungle of tangled trunks and toppled hemlocks with roots reaching nine feet into the air. It was Grady's grandfather, Gary, and volunteer, Mary Kenny, who discovered and rescued Grady the following morning. After a two-hour trek into the woods, the two heard the sound of crying and found the boy shortly after. Upon seeing his grandfather, Grady ran to his arms. Aside from a few small scratches, Grady was unharmed. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, the way the community responded to Grady's disappearance was nothing short of extraordinary. People, many of whom were dealing with their own issues as a result of the hurricane, put their own needs aside to help the McKinnon family. I ask all members of this house to join me in celebrating Grady's rescue and in honouring the volunteers who showed up to search for him. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to acknowledge some heartbreaking news regarding what is to believe to be a tragic ending for a family in Lower Prospect. On Saturday, September 24th, we were hit by post-tropical storm Fiona. High winds, heavy wind and torrential rains knocked down trees, power lines, washed out roads and damaged shorelines. But this storm left devastating destruction for many. As for the Smith family, they lost a member of their family, Larry Smith. It appears that the storm has taken this beloved member from their family. Larry Smith, at the age of 81, was likely swept out to sea. He was reported missing on Saturday at 3 o'clock when a family member went to check on him and noticed the patio door being open. A helicopter from the Department of Lands and Forestry searched, sorry, natural resources and renewables searched by air while joint rescue searched the shoreline around Hennessy's Island, where Mr. Smith resided as the sole occupant on the island. Canadian Coast Guard vessels, boats and sonar equipment also combed the shorelines 
but were not successful in finding Mr. Smith. I'd like the members of the House of Assembly to join me in thanking members of the Canadian Coast Guard and staff from the Department of Natural Resources and Renewables for their gallant efforts to head out in severe and dangerous conditions to search for a respected and, long, and loved longtime resident of Lower Prospect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, I rise to recognize the Dartmouth Community Fridge. The fridge and pantry are open to anyone needing food 24 hours a day, seven days a week on the grounds of Christ Church in downtown Dartmouth. It's stocked with staples like dried goods, fresh fruit and vegetables, but also frozen meals, snacks, pet foods and hygiene products. Everyone's invited to leave what they can and take what they need, and they have been doing that. This truly grassroots project was brought to life by the community with support from Christchurch and the Public Goods Society of Dartmouth, along with various restaurants and organizations who pitch in their time and effort. It's a completely volunteer-run effort and allows people from all walks of life who need a little support the opportunity to access nourishment on their own schedule. While we work to make food banks redundant in Nova Scotia, please join me in thanking the people of Dartmouth for creating and maintaining this valuable resource in our community. The Honourable Member for Truro Bible Hill, Millbrook, Simon River. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the incredible efforts of communities across Nova Scotia in the wake of Hurricane Fiona's destruction on September 23rd and 24th. Weeks after the storm hit the region, cleanup efforts continued throughout my constituency of Truro Bible Hill, Millbrook, and Salmon River. Trees were uprooted from the ground, power poles were torn in half, and areas experienced extensive flooding. In Truro, our treasured Victoria Park, many of the stately old growth eastern hemlock trees have been uprooted and broken, and the cleanup will continue as we move forward. Our community is so thankful to the dedicated crews from Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Ontario, and the U.S. who work tirelessly to ensure residents receive safe and reliable power. I am also proud of the all-hands-on-deck coordinated effort of the Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing responsible for EMO, DNR, local municipal leaders, staff, fire departments, first responders, the Canadian military, volunteers, that supported the comfort centers, as well as the local businesses and organizations, and the community as a whole for stepping up to support one another in this time of need. Mr. Speaker, that's truly the Nova Scotian way. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sydney, Member 2. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, rise my place uh, to thank everyone at home, and, and many members uh, will be providing member statements about the support that they've received in their communities uh, during and after Hurricane Fiona. Sydney is no different. Uh, we saw severe damage within our communities. We saw a lot of people uh, trapped in their own homes at, uh, at points of the storm, and I rise my place to thank everybody involved, whether it was the Red Cross, whether it was the Salvation Army who delivered thousands of meals to people who couldn't access food, our utility workers, our first responders, everybody on the ground with the municipality. Uh, it was a community effort, um, and I've, I've seen it a few times now uh, in our community during weather events, and uh, everybody just really rallies together to support everyone. So I rise my place as the member for City Member 2 to congratulate and thank everyone for working tirelessly to make sure that our communities all recover uh, following uh, what has been one of the most devastating, if not the most de devastating weather event in our community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier. Speaker, this week will mark 21 days since Fiona made landfall in Nova Scotia. Before the storm made landfall, some residents of Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier, had to evacuate their homes. These residents had windows smashed, trees had come down on, their ho on the houses, roofs had come off. <coughs> One resident reported the roof was now in their backyard. So many of us watched as the sun rose to reveal the utter devastation Fiona left. I had residents trapped in their homes due to trees, smashed cars, roofs ripped off, downed power poles, and roads blocked for, emer blocked for emergency vehicles. Mr. Speaker, the damage was extensive, and so much damage remains. This cleanup is ongoing. There are still people without power and internet. Residents, residents are struggling to clean up their properties, and municipalities are the municipality of CBRM is struggling to clean up 
um, of, of their properties as well. Mr. Speaker, these storms are becoming more frequent. Nova Scotia Power CEO and this government must take responsibility for the inadequate and out-of-date infrastructure so this does not happen again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize our armed forces under the responsibility of Brigadier General Stéphane Messon. <coughs> Stéphane, and, as well as their troops, helped many of our constituents during the aftermath of the storm by helping to clear trees for those who could not get out of their homes, as well as wellness checks for our most vulnerable constituents without power and running water. I am very thankful to the armed forces for their help which likely helped speed up power restoration for those without, as well as checking on their safety and well-being of the constituents. Having the armed forces in my community was a big encouragement to the people, and I'm very thankful to have Stefan's troops to assist during this time. Mr. Speaker, today I ask for all everyone to join me in thanking our Canadian Armed Forces for their service to our area after Hurricane Fiona and in service to our country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to commend Mullins Right Stop and Albert Bridge, Cape Breton, for the outstanding support they provided to their communities surrounding areas during Hurricane Fiona. The owners and staff worked tire tirelessly to meet the needs of their customers, even when they had no power themselves. They kept their customers and community members aware of when supplies were coming in, including gas, uh, which we know was a significant issue in Cape Breton following the storm. Their dedication and compassion are continuously evident in the community. Today, Mr. Speaker, I would like to take this time to applaud the owners and staff at Mullins Right Stop to their continued dedication for their community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to take a moment to speak to the resiliency, compassion and kindness that we've all witnessed in the wake of Hurricane Fiona in the hardest hit parts of, in the hardest hit parts of our province. Uh, in Cape Breton, Guysboro, Cumberland, Antigonish, the Pictos, Eastern Shore, affected area of HRM, uh, other areas that were impacted, we saw firsthand the generosity, strength and determination of neighbours, community halls, service organisations and of course first responders. People who were sharing everything they could with one another including generators, meals and a place to rest. Cape Breton University International students set up a makeshift kitchen feeding hot meals to hundreds, saying it's simply part of their Sikh culture to share food and comfort with anyone who may need both. From teenagers filling up cans of gas and delivering them to seniors to the local YMCA, allowing people to use its showers, the list goes on and on, Mr. Speaker, the acts of kindness that we saw. I'd like to ask this House to join me in thanking and applauding Nova Scotians during such a disastrous time in their lives. They may have lost their electricity, but their human spirit could not have shone brighter, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to celebrate the 14th annual Nocturne Festival, happening now in Halifax. This festival brings art and energy to the streets of HRM with the perspective that art can be found anywhere. There are so many highlights for this year. At the Nova Scotia Archives Gallery, I Am What I Am is a group show based on constructs of identity. At the Halifax Central Library, Little Children Are Beings They Found You, or by, led by Michelle Silboy and Sarah Prosper, includes 18 light boxes that project Mi'kmaq hieroglyphic messages. By approaching each light box, exhibition visitors will light up the ceiling with community messages of grief, sorrow, love, and care. Mr. Speaker, I ask all members to share my gratitude to Nocturne volunteers and employees. It's an opportunity for everyone to experience the art of Chibuktuk in a whole new light. The Honourable Member for Sackville, Cabaquid. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Rachel Smith, Cheryl Newcomb, Bob Price, and many others graciously and selflessly volunteered their time by making arrangements to provide an emergency shelter from Hurricane Fiona at the Sackville Area Warming Centre in Lower Sackville. The volunteers planned and coordinated and took shifts to ensure the centre was able to stay open and available all night to those who are homeless. Food was donated in abundance by local organizations, which in turn was made available, of course, to all the guests throughout the night. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask that all members of the House of Assembly join me in thanking Rachel, 
Cheryl, Bob, and all the volunteers with the Sackville Area Warming Center for working together to provide a warm and welcoming safe haven from the storm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bedford Basin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to congratulate uh, one of our own or a former member of this House, Francine Cosman. Francine um, was the MLA for Bedford Muscadabit uh, for several terms here. She was also a Deputy Speaker and Minister of Community Services. And Francine has just gone on to write a book entitled Nurse, um, and, uh, oh, whoops, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Mr. Props. Speaker, Mr. sorry, Mr. Speaker, no props. Uh, she has written a book, uh, my copy has just arrived, so I was very excited, sorry about that, Mr. Speaker, but uh, it's about her career as a nurse and how that actually prepared her for all the roles that she went on to take uh, after that time, including President of the Nova Scotia Advisory Council on the status of women. So I'd like to congratulate uh, my constituent, Francine Cosman, the Honourable Francine Cosman, and um, I don't think we're allowed to encourage our colleagues to go out and buy that book on Amazon, so I won't do that, but I do want to I do want to congratulate her. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would assume there must be royalties in that advertisement. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Halifax Shabakto. Mr. Speaker, I, I mark together with all the House our sorrow at the tragic passing on September 17th of Dr. Meinhard Dole. Dr. Dole, who was 58, was a highly respected and much beloved professor of environmental law at the Schulich School of Law. His research and writing focused on public participation in environmental decision making, on environmental assessments and climate change. He was drafter of the Nova Scotia Environment Act and <coughs> policy advisor in the development of the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. In 2014, Dr. Dole co-authored a new regulatory framework for low-impact, high-volume agriculture in Nova Scotia, widely known as the Dole-Leahy Report, a definitive and masterful synthesis of scientific and policy complexities into a clear and cogent path for agriculture in Nova Scotia. It was one of his many signature contributions to public policy in our province, and his passing is indeed marked with great sorrow. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise to recognize Mr. Paul Farrow of Amherst. During the aftermath of Hurricane Fiona, Paul had been having dreams of feeding the seniors. He woke up and organized with the help of local businesses and volunteers to gather hot meals, sandwiches, as well as tea and coffee for seniors in our neighboring uh, constituency of Cumberland South, which is where Mr. Farrow grew up. He helped seniors in the communities of River Hibbert and Joggins, who had no power and running water. The love Paul Farrow has for his community during this time is a great example of how our communities, communities come together to help those in need. I am so very proud of the work done by Paul to help our seniors and the care he has for them. Today, please join me in thanking Paul Farrow for bringing hot food to our seniors and vulnerable people of Cumberland County. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the Diab family and their store Expressway. Located in Woodlawn, the Diab family stepped up to provide assistance to residents of Dartmouth after Hurricane Fiona. They had coffee machines and hot water available to anyone without power. They also offered to get supplies to anyone in the community who may have been unable to get out on their own. At a time when people needed a helping hand from their neighbour, the Diab family and Expressway were there to help. Mr. Speaker, I ask that members of the provincial legislature join me in acknowledging the Nova Scotians that stepped up for their communities in the aftermath of Hurricane Fiona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to acknowledge an amazing educator for my community. More sp specifically, a teacher from J.L. Osley High School, Sabine Fells. Sabine has worked with thousands of students and opened their eyes and heart to, to art and culture. She has used art to teach our youth about poverty, racism, and social issues. Because of her hard work and dedication, she has been awarded the Prime Minister's Award for Teaching Excellence. 
thank you to um, a actually a much deserved uh, recognition I will say thank you to Sabine for your lifelong dedication to arts youth and making the world a better place you truly loved and appreciate it thank you mr. speaker the honorable member for Halifax Needham Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise to recognize a community worker and advocate, Sobaz Benjamin, founder and executive director of In My Own Voice, I've Move Arts Association. Sobaz is a film director as well as a mentor, program facilitator, and educator. In 2009, he partnered with the Nova Scotia Justice Department to deliver his life story course, The Kintsugi Monologues, KM, at the Nova Scotia Youth Facility at Central Nova Scotia Correctional Facility and the Nova Scotia Community College. Sobaz was honored in 2014 by the Provincial Justice Department with the Minister's Award for Individual Leadership in Crime Prevention. Sobaz has also received a Human Rights Award for his work with youth and directing awards from the National Film Board of Canada and the Canadian Academy of Cinema and Television. I would like all members of the House today to help me thank Sobaz Benjamin for all the work that he continues to do in our community and beyond. The Honourable Member for Hants East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to recognize Nick McIsaac and his landscaping company, McIsaac Landscaping. As people were preparing for, her, for Hurricane Fiona to arrive, Nick wanted to ensure everyone was prepared and offered to help seniors pro properly secure their belongings free of charge. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank Nick for his generosity. Being a part of the community that comes together in times of need is truly amazing to see. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Preston. Mr. Speaker, I rise in the House today to acknowledge those in the Preston constituency who went above and beyond during Hurricane Fiona. First, I want to acknowledge the North Preston Community Centre Community Mobilization Team who offered showers, water, their kitchen, electronics for days and evenings when we waited for power. I also want to thank the Porters Lake Park and the Nova Scotia Oh, Department of Natural Resources uh, facilities, uh, ready, ready to use constituents, members, washrooms and showers. And then further, I would like to say thank you to Ms. Erica Fleck, who heard many concerns regarding the disaster response and understanding of the constituency needs in particular in the Preston Township and the seven days waiting for uh, power to be returned on. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, Stepping Stone is an organization that supports current and former sex workers, people at risk of entering the sex trade, and people who have been sex trafficked. Though I have long admired their work, I recently got to know the folks at Stepping Stone a little better because they uh, started holding programs across the hall from my former constituency office. My office colleagues and I loved the laughter, camaraderie, and energy that Stepping Stone brought to our building. I rise today to congratulate everyone at Stepping Stone on their recent purchase of a building in Dartmouth North. The new to them building will be renovated to include space for client drop-in programming, donations, outreach and court support staff and computers for their clients to use. Excitingly, the upstairs will be turned into an apartment for transitional housing for clients who face barriers to finding and keeping housing. I am thrilled that Stepping Stone is putting down roots in Dartmouth North, and I ask the whole house to join me in celebrating this big move for this vital organization. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Eastern Shore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to bring recognition to Eastern Shore residents Molly and Gordy Gammon for their exceptional efforts in opening and maintaining a community comfort centre in Moser River in the aftermath of Hurricane Fiona. The Gammons provided refreshments, charging stations and general support to community members impacted by the hurricane at the Moser River Community Hall. A warm, safe location with good food and hot drinks can lift the spirits for residents during times of stress and uncertainty. I ask that all members of the Assembly join me in acknowledging Molly and Gordy for their continued community-oriented volunteerism and for bringing true Nova Scotian hospitality to those negatively affected by the recent storm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Armdale. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to take this opportunity today uh, to recognize the members of Halifax Armdale constituents. Uh, during the hurricane, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, go around the neighbors and the constituents, uh, and I was uh, truly uh, see the true color of Halifax Armdale constituents. Neighbors helping neighbors, uh, strangers assisting strangers, uh, people coming together. And this is one of the testimony we as a community, when something happens, we stand each other, we help each other. 
And that's what makes us, as a people, as a province, I would like to recognize all Nova Scotians who during this difficult time to stand up and help uh, their neighbors, their colleagues, and quite honest, uh, this is when we do the best when we get together. Not necessarily to wait somebody else or the government. And thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to pay tribute to all the amazing Fiona volunteers and workers. First, I want to thank every worker who had to work before, during, and after the storm. These workers didn't go to work because they wanted to, but because they had to. They need to put food on the table and pay bills. They had to work when they didn't have power or phone service. They had damage to their homes and property. I want to thank power line technicians, forestry technicians, damage accessors, field support workers, and the Canadian Armed Forces for all their hard work. So many workers came from across the country and from Maine. My thanks to everyone. Every day I traveled the riding, Mr. Speaker, of Cape Breton Centre Whitney Pier. This allowed me the privilege to witness the community coming together. The volunteers of the New Waterford and Reserve Mines Comfort Centers did yeoman's work. They worked extremely hard. Community organizations like the BGC of Cape Breton, Undercurrent, and the Salvation Army stepped up to feed people. Other community organizations and businesses donated food and other products, including access to washrooms and showers. The generosity was heartwarming. I can't thank them enough or express my appreciation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Colchester North. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, from the moment Hurricane Fiona touched down and wreaked havoc on Nova Scotia, including Colchester North, Charlene Fletcher went into action. Charlene worked extra hours with Public Works, helping with traffic control for Nova Scotia power as well as debris removal, putting in many long hours and days without a break. During her little bit of spare time, she made an effort to check in with her neighbours. Asking nothing in return, Charlene offered her barns and fields to a farmer for his horses after he lost his barn due to the hurricane. She has been actively helping seniors and those who, those who with, extend, those with extended power outages while she herself was without power for 12 days. Charlene volunteered to help residents in the community, fill out hurricane relief rebates for food and tree removal, and also answered fire calls for the Bass Fervent District Volunteer Fire Brigade. Mr. Speaker, in a time of crisis, we ask that we be kind and help our neighbours. Charlene never needs to be asked to lend a hand. She is always the first to step up and offer her assistance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Mr. Speaker, I'd be remiss if I didn't get up and join my colleagues in thanking uh, the people in Nova Scotia for stepping up during what was a, a difficult week weekend, uh, and I know that some people continue to face challenges as a result of Hurricane Fiona. Hammonds Plains Lucasville was no different. Um, how fortunate are we all to live in a province and in communities where uh, no questions asked, people are willing to put the hardship of others before their own. Uh, I'm grateful for that. I know that we all are and I know that we'll never be able to truly express how thankful we actually are for the efforts that the crews, the first responders, the volunteers and the average Nova Scotian put in uh, over the last several weeks. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to share my appreciation for the vibrant Prismatic Arts Festival. It's an annual multidisciplinary arts festival that celebrates work by Indigenous artists and artists of colour from across Canada. Prismatic has been bringing audiences vibrant, boundary-pushing new works in theatre, dance, music, film, visual arts, media arts, and spoken word since 2008. This year, highlights included the staging of Cliff Cardinal's Huff, as well as a unique collaboration amongst the Upstream Music Collective, Breaking Circus, and Sarah Prosper. In the community, Prismatic supported artists at the 2022 Indigenous, International Indigenous Music Summit and Contact East Conference, both held in Halifax in September, and through master classes in collaboration with the Fountain School of the Performing Arts at Dalhousie. Mr. Speaker, I ask all members to join me in thanking the Prismatic team for another amazing year. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank everyone who stepped up in Nova Scotia to help after Hurricane Fiona, but I want to tell a story of how a wonderful new Ross resident spent the day after Hurricane Fiona. Ms. Terry Ann Scarf is an employee at the Home Hardware in Chester. She received a call from a fa frantic father in Alberta looking for a generator for his daughter, a single mother who was without power alone with her children in Cape Breton. Home Hardware had already sold all of their inventory, but Terry Ann got into her vehicle and drove her own generator towards Cape Breton. No money was exchanged, only hugs and tears. Terry Ann said she was just doing what any Nova Scotian would do. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank Terry Ann Scarf for her incredible act of Nova Scotia kindness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cold Harbour Dartmouth. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to acknowledge and thank all of our emergency management professionals and volunteers for their skill and dedication in responding to the challenges brought to our province by Tropical Storm Fiona. Without their commitment, preparation and practice, the results of this extreme weather event could have been much worse. It is gratifying to see the collaboration among our various emergency service providers and perhaps even more so to hear the lengths to which some individuals went to ensure our citizens have access to the critical services that they require, such as the following story I'd like to share with you from the Dartmouth General Hospital Foundation. Our patient flow manager was driving to work and came across someone holding up a tree across Pleasant Street so that the cars could pass. When this manager arrived at work, she learned it was actually a nurse from the Dartmouth General Hospital who was holding up that tree. So in addition to our emergency response teams, I'd also like to thank everyone at the Dartmouth General Hospital for their continued hard work and dedication. We see how much you care for your patients and community, for which we are immensely grateful. Thank you to all Nova Scotians, as we've said here in the House, in the small and big ways that you played in your respective neighbourhoods in the recovery. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Shabuckdaw. Congratulations to the Twin Bays Coalition, the Association for the Preservation of the Eastern Shore, Protect Liverpool Bay, and St. Mary's Bay Protectors, who together will continue their successful joint community event series tonight with a reception at the Brewery Market in Halifax, launching Catherine Collins and Doug Francis' new book, Salmon Wars, The Dark Underbelly of Our Favorite Fish, published by Macmillan. Together with partners the Ecology Action Centre, the Atlantic Salmon Federation, the Nova Scotia Salmon Association, the Council of Canadians, St. Margaret's Bay Stewardship Association, and Friends of Nature, the community organizations have hosted a series of well-attended public meetings in Sandy Cove, Lake Charlotte, Mahone Bay, Upper Tantallon, and now Halifax, featuring Collins and Francis' investigative expose of environmental degradation and community marginalization by multinational open net pen aquaculture corporations. The series is a real model for how investigative research and community organizing can intersect for social change and common purpose, and this evening's reception promises to continue in this strong vein. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Waverly, Fall River, Beaver Bank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, please join me in thanking the board members of the Beaver Bank Kinzak Community Centre and the many volunteers who provided warmth, food and support during and after Hurricane Fiona. Along with the standard supports offered by the many hardworking volunteers at these centres, local community members pulled together to help. Volunteers brought food and cooked a pot of soup and even a turkey dinner for those who were without power. People's safety is most important during any crisis, and the extra care provided from strangers is heartwarming and appreciated by those who are in need. Mr. Speaker, please join me in thanking the Beaver Bank Kinzak Community Centre for everything they do and for providing a safe space for our community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the Canada Game Centre. In, in my community during Hurricane Fiona. The Canada Game Center was set up as an evacuation shelter during Hurricane Fiona. I had the opportunity to visit the center and, see, and saw firsthand the, the hard work of volunteers and members from four organizations, the Salvation Army of the Maritimes, the Canadian Red Cross, St. John's Ambulance, and the Disaster Animal Rescue Team of Nova Scotia. All worked together to help the evacuees. Clayton Park West, constituents were also welcome to use the site to charge their phones. 
I would ask that the House join me in recognizing the Canada Game Centre and many volunteer organizations for supporting, for supporting all Nova Scotians during Hurricane Fiona. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to recognize the East Preston United Baptist Church for its 180th year of serving the Lord through its great works. EPUBC was founded on September 12, 1842 through the gallant efforts of Father Richard Preston, the founding father of the African United Baptist Association of Nova Scotia. Our ancestors had faith in God, and as strong believers, they recognized the church as being central to their existence. The ancestors knew that a place of worship was a haven to some a rock for others, and an anchor for many. September 9th, I was honored to be a part of EPUBC's 180th celebration, and it was a wonderful time. The spirit truly moved me, and I was glad to be in the house of the Lord. I would like the house to help me congratulate East Preston United Baptist Church on their 180th anniversary as they march forward with efforts to be the motivating force in the lives of many people who look to it for direction and guidance. Gunnable. Member for Guysborough Trackety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize the municipality of the District of Guysborough and the municipality of the County of Antigonish for their efforts leading up to, during, and after Hurricane Fiona. As the constituency of Guysborough Trackety expands into both these municipal units, I was able to be part of storm preparation meetings and was in constant contact with both municipalities during the storm and after. Mr. Speaker, all weather reports and tracking showed the coast of Guysborough County as a direct hit, and the municipality of the District of Guysborough was ready should there be need to be evacuations in these areas. Although there were trees down and power losses, some for more than two weeks, our coastal communities were not lost, nor did they suffer major damage. Antigonish County suffered more of the storm than expected, but their EMO team was in place and worked together to help get those who needed it and continued to do so. Mr. Speaker, I ask the House join me in congratulating the municipality of the District of Guysborough and the municipality of the County of Antigonish on their commitment to the safety of their residents during Hurricane Fiona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Northside Westbound. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over the coming days, I, I will recognize people in my community who stepped up during uh, the crisis in Cape Breton with regard to Hurricane Fiona. Um, this particular case, uh, a resident recognized the need for more comfort centres in the community, and her community did not have such a centre for people to go. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, Lisa Bond stepped forward and created um, created a, 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 an atmosphere in Florence in conjunction with the fire hall. She sourced food, she sourced a generator, she sourced people, and she fed people for over a week, Mr. Speaker. And it's, uh, it's people like Lisa Bond that step forward and uh, make our community what it is. So I'd like the House to congratulate Lisa on her hard work during the Order, Hurricane please, Fiona. Steve. The time for statements by members has expired. Before we move into oral questions put to ministers, I would uh, just like to remind everybody about the one-minute time limit. I let it go today because it was recognizing the contribution of community towards uh, Fiona and the disasters each community faced. But from now on, it's going to be one minute or... Good fair speaker. Yeah. <laughs> Oral questions put by members to ministers. The time is now 2 o'clock. We'll continue to 2.50. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for your rulings that have always been fair to this chamber and to all MLAs in the House, no matter which party. And, Mr. Speaker, the Speaker's office acts independently of the Premier, the Premier's office, and government. These are important words, Mr. Speaker, for our democracy, especially when you take into consideration what's happening in democracies around the world. But I do have to admit these wise words are not my own, Mr. Speaker. They're the words of the Premier, and I'd like to table those. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask the Premier if he stands behind these words, and if so, why has he applied pressure on the Speaker to resign his seat? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, going, to rule, I'm going to rule that uh, line of questioning out of order at this point because this is an internal house issue and it's uh, not your uh, question should be addressed to the minister regarding any portfolio they might have so i hope you understand that but i'm going to rule it out of order for now 
the Honourable Leader of the Liberal Party on another question. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Question, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I may have spoken too, uh, too soon <laughs> earlier. Um, I do believe that this is a matter of the utmost importance for our, for our democracy, uh, for this chamber. Um, we do have a standing convention uh, in this House. That's very important that there is not executive or premier uh, pressure that's put on the Speaker so the, the Speaker can act fairly uh, and discerning on behalf of all members. So I do uh, want to ask the Premier, uh, because I do think this is a matter uh, of the Chamber, uh, why these actions have happened and what provisions is the Premier willing to make to ensure that this House and its members are protected. Before we move on, I'm going to read a ruling here. And this is uh, Section 31.1. On the order of the day, oral questions put by members to ministers be read on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Oral questions asking for information or action may be put without notice to the ministers of the Crown for not more than 50 minutes. And any such questions shall be concisely put and shall relate only to the matters for which a minister is officially responsible. Okay, I'll, I'm going to make one more ruling, and, and this is something that the clerk and I had spoken about before. Uh, it's not the Premier's responsibility about the Speaker. It's the House of Assembly's responsibility as to what governs speakers. <laughs> the Honourable Leader of the Liberal Party on his final supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my point exactly, I will accept your ruling on the matter. Um, Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotians have rallied together during this difficult time and pulled together through Hurricane Fiona. But after spending multiple days in Cape Breton and hearing from individuals affected in other parts of the province, uh, we can say that we are hearing from affected individuals that more needs to be done, particularly on the a human resources side for removal of debris, but also for processing of applications and supporting people with those applications. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier is, uh, can he commit today to ensure there's more boots on the ground in affected areas of the province to help individuals access the supports that are being made available to them? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is an important question. The damage, uh, the, the devastation across many parts of this province is really kind of heartbreaking. And I had a chance to, to see a lot of it firsthand. And the cleanup will take a long time. Uh, this is precisely the reason why I was uh, after the federal government to support us with military help. And there are many times, Mr. Speaker, in the world of partisan politics when we can be at each other's throats, but there are times when we should bind together. And Mr. Speaker, the opposition missed a beautiful opportunity to get behind the government in support of Nova Scotians, in calling on the federal government for additional military support, for boots on the ground. Mr. Speaker, they decided to politicize the recovery. We on this side of the House are focused on Nova Scotians and supporting Nova Scotians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. This government promised to fix health care. By every measure so far, that promise has not been kept, and Nova Scotians are experiencing the painful consequences. Yesterday, the Health Authority issued a blanket warning about overcrowding at emergency rooms in all zones. Things have gotten so bad that the government's legislative committee members have begun to hide the Health Authority CEO, or interim CEO, I guess, from the public. And this month's doctor's waitlist numbers are mysteriously late. And so my question is, will the Premier explain what has gone so terribly wrong? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, what I would say is this government, look, there's, a, there's real issues in health care. There's no question about that. Issues around access to care are, are decades standing, uh, for sure, Mr. Speaker. And they're going to take time to fix, and they're going to take money to fix. But I will assure Nova Scotians 
that we are committed to making sure they can access the health care they need, when they need it, where they need it. And under the leadership of the minister and the senior health leadership team and everyone working in health care, we are making changes that will have an impact over the course of time. They'll take time, Mr. Speaker, but this government, in terms of what is really happening in the health care system, is the most transparent. We have a whole website where we give out every statistic of what's going on. We want Nova Scotians to know what's happening in their health care system, Mr. Speaker, and we are very forthright about it. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party on her first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The sad fact is that most Nova Scotians can't access any health care anytime they need it anywhere in the province. Mr. Speaker, the Premier says that the real work is happening, but Nova Scotians aren't so sure. A narrative poll released recently showed that 83% of Nova Scotians rated the quality of health care available in the province as fair or poor. And this is worse than before this government was elected on a single promise. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier know something that patients and their families don't? The Honourable Premier. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the, the question around access to health care is something that uh, we're, we're very focused on because that's where Nova Scotians asked us to focus. We continue to focus there. And we know there are issues. The issues are national for sure, Mr. Speaker. The same, the same, the same survey, if you read into the fine print, it's asked people how they feel when they have an interaction with the health care system, Mr. Speaker, and it's pretty positive. And you know why that is, Mr. Speaker? Because we have the best healthcare professionals working very hard to provide health care every single day. The member opposite would have you believe that nobody is accessing health care in the province, Mr. Speaker. That is absolutely wrong. We have a long way to go, but people can get tremendous care in this health care system in Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to work to fix it. We know there's work to be done. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party on her final supplementary. Just to clear up the record, I spent yesterday at the Dartmouth General personally thanking all of the health care workers in my community, so I'm not saying anything about the health care workers. I'm talking about this government and their efforts to fix health care. And Mr. Speaker, one wrinkle faced by many people is the fact that they can't afford the cost of their prescriptions. Mm -hmm. A survey by Feed Nova Scotia found that 50% of respondents, 50% didn't fill or collect a prescription for their medication or had skipped a dose in the last 12 months because they didn't have enough money. When people are forced to scrimp or save and not take important medication, they end up sick, and they often end up looking for health care that isn't there. This summer, when I asked the Premier if he would waive pharmacare fees, he said that I had raised an important question and that he would certainly take that away and look at it, and I'll table that. Mr. Speaker, I'll ask the Premier again. Will he do this one straightforward, specific thing to make sure that people are able to afford their drugs and eliminate pharmacare fees for at least one year? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it is an important. Of course, we want everyone to take the prescriptions that, uh, that have uh, been issued to them by a health care professional. Of course, every Nova Scotian wants that, Mr. Speaker. And I will say that, uh, you know, we did a tour last, last uh, fall talking to health care professionals. I know the minister and the senior leadership team are going to do that tour again coming up. There's a lot that's going on. There's a lot of interaction with health care professionals. There's a lot of listening to health care professionals. That's something that they're, still, that they're still pleased to have happen. They're not used to it in this province. But we respect health care professionals, and we will listen to health care professionals because we know that getting care for Nova Scotians is the only thing that matters to Nova Scotians, and it's, and it's a high priority for us, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is, is also for the Premier, and it's in regard to uh, a situation and just looking for some information, uh, Mr. Speaker. So uh, last week, the Premier's office uh, confirmed that they were looking to make a move uh, in this legislature. It was confirmed by another member from, uh, from the government side, uh, Eastern Shore. It was confirmed by the Speaker himself. Uh, and yesterday, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, 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 uh, the Premier indicated that media, he was blaming media for fabricating stories. Order, so my order, question please. to the Premier order, is... Please. Order, please. Order, please. Order, please. I have made my ruling concerning those questions, and I ask that people please stand by that ruling. So uh, if the member for Northside Westmount has another question, we'll entertain that. The uh, Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I will stand by your ruling, although um, I think it's, it's, it's not right because this should information. Nova Scotians deserve it. Yeah. My question is for the Premier. Um, I support you 100 percent, Mr. Speaker. Order, My please. question for order, the please. Or, order, please. Can we please drop this subject and move on to the business we're here to do? At this point, I recognize the Honourable Member for Northside Westmount with a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, my question uh, to the Premier is regarding uh, supports in Cape Breton with regard to um, disaster cleanup. Um, the municipality has been calling on this Premier to help and provide more supports. So my question is, when will those supports arrive, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing. So thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do want to recognize that uh, the Hurricane Fiona has caught a swath across the province and not only in Cape Breton but counties across the eastern mainland severely hit. We're very concerned about that. We've been very proactive reacting to that, as the, the member would know, and uh, there are a number of supports in place already, and I will point to one called the Disaster Financial Assistance Program, and I'm, I'm very proud with how quickly we've come out with that, and that is uh, one, one option among many uh, that are available. To, uh, to people across the province. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount on your second question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Um, with regards to the Disaster Relief Fund, yes, that's a wonderful program. But my question was specifically about boots on the ground. There are people with trees on their homes, people with uh, unable to get in and out of their homes. So when will we see more boots on the ground uh, to help the municipality deal with the significant over 800 eight to 1,000 trees still sitting on properties? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. So uh, again, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I do want to recognize the great concerns among many, many homeowners across the province, including in Cape Breton. And uh, the, the member, I believe, is asking about boots on the ground. I think that, if, if I'm not mistaken, that's a direct reference to military assistance. We have put in five requests for uh, military assistance. And, uh, the, uh, the, as the member knows, this is something that we, we put in the request. The military looks at what, the, and the federal government look at what they can supply. They supply that. As the member also knows, the, the prime minister offered a $300 million a fund administered through ACOA. We don't have the details on that yet either. So we look forward to them for that. As far as our part, we have announced the DFA, and I will point out, in fact, I will table that uh, if some of you may remember Dorian. That order, happened order, in please. September of 2000. Order, please. Order, please. The time for to answer that question has long since expired. The Honourable Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I will say if, if uh, the Premier or anybody reviews the public record uh, on the hurricane, uh, they'll see positive comments made by myself and members of the caucus. Right. There's certainly, uh, I think if you review the record of, of today's answer, you'll see that it's not myself that's politicized this issue. Uh, but we do have a role uh, as MLAs to voice concerns and express those concerns in the House. Uh, what we're hearing right now is the need for help with folks to uh, apply for the supports that have been granted for them. Uh, we do support the government's uh, intention to get more, an effort to get more military boots on the ground, but we also need more clerical people that can help assist individuals with uh, the applications themselves and, of course, uh, on the processing question, front. So my question to the Premier is, can we expect more provincial human resources to assist on that front? What do you what do you today? <laughs> the Honourable Minister for Service, Nova Scotia. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the member's question. And, and this government got to work immediately. And within days after the, the hurricane, Mr. Speaker, we, we announced the programs, and within days after that, we launched them online and, and, and followed through with uh, paper applications. Got that into the hands of the MLA offices. Mr. Speaker, uh, the folks in the department worked around the clock to get these, uh, these applications going. 
And frankly, Mr. Speaker, they also uh, stood up uh, opening up the access centres in, in a number of locations. Today, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've received upwards of 107,000 uh, applications. Uh, 5,000 checks are going out the door today, Mr. Speaker. Can you continuously looking at how we can improve uh, access to these programs? So, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in terms of helping people prepare for these events, because we know that we are going to see uh, more extreme weather events here in Nova Scotia as we've lost that protective shield of cold water around our peninsular province, um, I do think it's important that individuals uh, have guidelines uh, and on preparedness and on what to do in the event that these things happen. Uh, can the government commit today, and I will ask the Premier, to ensure that uh, we do prepare emergency uh, guidelines for individuals to know what to do in advance? of uh, an extreme weather event and what they can expect for supports and how to apply for those supports okay. post-weather uh, event. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. So thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and in my role as Minister of EMO, I can tell you that this is a concern of ours exactly as well. And uh, you, may, you may know we opened up the provincial coordination centre on the morning of Friday, Friday morning at 8 o'clock we opened it up. We were preemptive in opening up that centre, realizing the magnitude of the storm. There will be also, and, and we had a fair number, a, a fair bit of messaging going out from our department, from EMO, on, on preparedness for the storm. Obviously, uh, after the fact, we will be doing uh, what you could call a post-mortem on, on the storm and on our response and on all the different ways that this happened and how can we, how can we re improve that, and we will certainly be doing that too. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bedford Basin. Mr. Speaker, I want to take this opportunity to commend the Nova Scotia Power Crews who are out 24-7 responding to Hurricane Fiona and thank all of those crews who came in from out of province to assist with the relief effort as well. But despite the Herculean effort of these folks on the front line, huge swaths of our province were without power during the storm and it took weeks for some of them to have it restored. We have a growing province but an aging power grid. Mr. Speaker, can the minister responsible for EMO please tell us what his office is doing to ensure that we are updating our power grid to be more resilient for the future? If you want to know. The Honourable Minister responsible for EMO. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, again, thank you for the question, and I, and I will reiterate the member's comments on, on the response by Nova Scotia Power, uh, the line crews that we saw on the ground from, from New Hampshire, from Vermont, from Maine, from uh, Quebec, Ontario, New Brunswick, and also our own one uh, line, Nova Scotia Power line crews. They really did more than a year's worth of work in two weeks, and it's an incredible amount of work that they did to renew the line. I think that the question of the strength of our electric system and, and how that functioned in the storm is something that, again, will be subject to post-mortem, and we, we will look at it as a government. I know Nova Scotia Power looks at it, and uh, how we take steps going forward to strengthen it, uh, I think that's something we, we need to consider. I know that Nova Scotians uh, love trees and love the trees in their own yard, but some of these trees are our enemies in these storms, and that's up to individuals to look at and uh, certainly is one factor in the whole thing. The, but we're very concerned about that question, and we, we will be looking at it going forward. The Honourable Member for Bedford Basin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, but what we're talking about here is, uh, and, and there's no quarrel about the fantastic work that was done by, uh, by the lines persons from, uh, from Nova Scotia and all across the country who came to our rescue, but what we're talking about here is prevention, Mr. Speaker. We have a lot of development currently underway in the downtowns and the suburban areas surrounding our towns and cities. Vast majorities of these areas are still serviced by above ground power poles, which are susceptible to the environment. We've all um, dealt with salty fog uh, over the years and lost power for uh, seemingly uh, surprising reasons. Bearing lines might be more expensive up front, but it can prevent repeat outages and the resulting maintenance. My question to the minister, will this government review the Nova Scotia power strategy concerning where new power lines are buried? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Energy. 
Something like that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member opposite for for the uh, for the question. It gives me an, uh, an opportunity as well to recognize uh, the more than 200 uh, members from uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and and Quebec uh, forestry crews that actually were activated to come in and give, put boots on the ground and and help Nova Scotia power. <laughs> throughout that, but I want to assure the member opposite and, and everyone in this house and uh, the, the, the residents in Nova Scotia, as the minister, I spoke to Nova Scotia Power sometimes four or five, six times a day in the first two weeks of the, of the uh, hurricane response. And there's something that was assured to me from, uh, from EMO staff and from Nova Scotia Power. Uh, there are still issues that are going on that they're fixing, um, but rest assured there is going to be a response and uh, a post-briefing afterwards and, and uh, action taken. Thank the you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth, Dart. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of uh, Natural Resources and Renewables. Nova Scotia Power is currently in the middle of an application process to increase power rates for Nova Scotians by at least 13 per cent. In March, the Minister said that ratepayers are the highest importance to this government and we will do everything we have, pull every lever we have, to protect those Nova Scotians that need protection. And I was going to—oh, no, I am going to table that. I'll table that. We saw the Premier take action against the application's proposed solar panel fees in February of this year, long before the hearing began. So, Mr. Speaker, the Premier's actions against the solar fees show a clear ability to alter Nova Scotia Power's demands. Will the Minister explain what he is doing to protect Nova Scotians from dramatic rate hikes? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member opposite. And we're still in pulling levers, Mr. Speaker. It, uh, it's not over yet. The hearing, uh, the hearing uh, speech is just uh, just finished. We haven't had the wrap up from uh, from opposition. We did something that was asked of us that the uh, previous government ignored for eight years. We allowed the hearing to go through. We didn't make backroom deals, Mr. Speaker, with Nova Scotia Power. The people in Nova Scotia wanted that hearing to go through because they haven't had a chance to state their case against Nova Scotia Power. We are not going to presuppose what's going to take place with the hearing. Mr. Speaker, we're here for the uh, ratepayers in Nova Scotia, and this government will stand behind the ratepayers in Nova Scotia. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, the proposed changes from Nova Scotia Power will see the company able to drastically increase its profits, and this comes after its parent company, Amera, reported record-breaking record profits for last year. Yesterday, at a public accounts me committee meeting, this government voted unanimously to protect Nova Scotia Power from appearing before the committee to be held accountable to the questions of Nova Scotians. Meanwhile, many Nova Scotians already struggling with the current cost of, of living crisis are unsure how they will be able to heat their homes this winter. Mr. Speaker, if ratepayers are of the highest importance to this government, as the minister has stated, can the minister explain why their government's approach has been to protect corporate profits over the interests of Nova Scotians? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I thank the member for the question. Uh, look, th this is an important issue for all Nova Scotians. Uh, we know affordability is uh, is the high high conversation everybody's supper table around Nova Scotians. Our government is acting. We have the home heating program. We have other programs that we've initiated through uh, through the Fiona response. We have put additions into into programs um, as a government. Uh, Long-term seniors care. We put some money back into the Nova Scotians that we know that need it as we move into this section. We can't. We can't. Order, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're not going to presuppose what's going to, going to come out. We, we have actions that we've already taken, and we have more actions and levers that we can pull as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cold Harbour, Dartmouth. Mr. Speaker, also on the subject of power lines, myself and our leader had the opportunity to meet with some of these service providers following the storm to review the response. The number one recommendation from Nova Scotia Power was clear. We need to be much more proactive with vegetation management in order to prevent future outages and reduce the extent of post-storm cleanup. My question, Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Emergency Management update Nova Scotians on how they plan to improve vegetation management throughout the province? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very short. This is already an issue that I've already brought to Nova Scotia Power, that at the post uh, debriefing, that's a topic that I do want to discuss as Minister. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cold Harbour, Dartmouth. Government has an important role to play, and we know we see that they are operating as so, 
but they have to facilitate a proactive storm preparedness. Right now, the only way to manage the issue is to deal with every single tree, shrub, bush, case by case, piecemeal basis. It not only hurts storm preparedness, it also means potentially unsafe issues are going unaddressed. So, Mr. Speaker, will the minister responsible for emergency management commit to working with the critical infrastructure utilities, that means all of them, and bringing them to the House in a plan form for vegetation management as part of their aforementioned post-mortem. The Minister, Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we're talking about pre-planning for the for the uh, any uh, any event that would take place, whether it's a hurricane, storm, or wind event uh, as such. And Mr. Speaker, that's what this government did last spring. We introduced legislation that's going to create the uh, performance standard table that will uh, give a report back to the UARB. And uh, out of that performance standard table as we develop the regulations, that's exactly the conversations that that performance table is going to be expected to have, to make recommendations to the UARB, to be re uh, ready for uh, pre-storms, to have reliability uh, on the grid. These are recommendations <coughs> that we've heard from, from uh, Nova Scotians that they want to see that they haven't seen prefer from previous governments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cole Herbert Dartmouth on a new question. Is. Mr. Speaker, one of the major issues caused by the storm was access to fuel. With power being out, many people were trying to refill their generators so they could cook a meal or power their devices. This caused a higher demand for fuel at the same time with many gas stations were out of power or running out of fuel to sell it themselves, leading to big lines at a few gas stations that were open. And it seems there was a lack of planning from the government to make sure people had access to fuel in case of a power outage. So my question to the Minister of Emergency Management is, what will the government and emergency management do in the future storms to make sure people have access to necessary fuels in times of extended outages? The Honourable Minister responsible for EMO. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member of the question. I mean, one of the things that we did do was, in the days prior to Fiona, once it became clear what we were going to be dealing with, we put out the message, fill up your fuel tanks, get fuel, get that on hand. We, we put that message out as best as we could. But clearly, in the aftermath, one of the things we saw in the Provincial Coordination Centre was that communities that were hard hit and did not have power had, had trouble getting uh, gasoline. There might be gasoline in the tank, but there was no power to get it out or the or the one station that did have electricity was empty so clearly this is something that in the aftermath will be a discussion on our part as government on how we deal with that we that aftermath discussion as i'm sure the member can appreciate hasn't happened yet but we're well aware of this and it is a major concern to us and just highlights how important the honorable, fuel is the honorable to us. member for cole herberger <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sometimes it takes an unprecedented situation to highlight what is not being done, that those in our province that can be left behind, and we want to highlight some areas where we think the government can do better going forward. We've heard from some of our disabled constituents who have specific needs different from the rest of the population. What happens when they are struck without power or service. Advocates like Ann Kamazi are calling for a voluntary registry to be created so that our emergency responders are aware that Nova Scotians with specific needs, and I can table that. Will the minister responsible for emergency management consider these advocates' proposal? The honorable member for community services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. It's a great one. Um, certainly, we will want to look at how we can create a database of individuals that are most vulnerable in our communities, but it will have to be driven by um, them self-wanting to identify so that we don't cross any privacy issues, but we're certainly discussing and looking at how we can improve something like that and be better prepared for those that are in vulnerable situations. We want to be there for them, so that discussion is happening now. The Honourable Member for Sydney, Member 2. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the average family of four spends about $1,230 a month on food, and I'll table uh, that. Uh, we're glad to see the government take some action on support, but only providing $100 to people who lost power and have to throw away their food isn't covering the bill. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as we all know, the storm happened about two days after most uh, income recipients would have received their, their, their payments. Uh, and at that point would have been filling their fridges with food. So they lost, uh, 
they lost a month worth of food. So my question to the Minister of EMO, will this government consider raising the relief amount for working Nova Scotian families who have lost entire fridges and freezers worth of food? The Honourable Minister responsible for EMO. Well, I'd like to thank the member for the question, and we do want to recognize the hardship this has caused many Nova Scotians. We we have stepped forward with really an unprecedented suite of, of uh, which has never happened before in the province of Nova Scotia in response to Fiona. And I will just uh, remind the member, I will table it during Dorian. Uh, four months later, the DFA was announced for, for, for the disaster financial relief for Dorian. Was was four months later. Uh, that, that your government did. So we have, yes, we have offered $100. We've offered $250 for tree clearing. There's other things. I mean, we continue to look at what we're doing. We know that uh, the federal government is offering uh, support too, and uh, that $300 million that's been offered by the federal government, we don't have the details on that yet. We look forward to what that will be. So we know there's more to do. We know there's more work to do, and we're, we're looking at what we're doing. But we've already done uh, more than any other government has the ever done in response. The Honourable Member for Sydney Membertu. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not going to play politics with the minister about timelines. We released the DFA 24 hours after the flood in 2016. We offered more food during that package. So, like, I just we're happy the government's doing what they're doing. We are, but families are asking these questions not only in Sydney but all over <coughs> Nova Scotia. The hundred dollars is an issue for people. It is. It's a legit question to ask the minister. Um, also, with that is is around the time around the 48 hours of the outage, and the Canadian Food Inspector. Agency says an unopened refrigerator uh, will keep food cold for about four hours, and I'll table that too as well, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the provincial government's own guidelines agree that after four hours without power, it's not safe to keep food in the fridge, and should be thrown out. And I'll table that uh, those question, guidelines. Please. However, the government will only provide relief for question, food if you please. lost power for 48 hours. So my question to the minister is: Will he expand the criteria beyond the 48 hours? The Honourable Minister responsible for EMO. So I'd like to thank the member for the question. And the reality is that $100 is one of the single largest line items in our disaster response. We know there's approximately 200,000 Nova Scotian households that would be eligible. It's a $20 million line item. It's a very massive commitment on our part. We've already, I believe the Minister of Service Nova Scotia has already indicated that we have about, a, uh, about uh, close to that. How much? 106,000 people who have applied. I could apply myself. I won't. I was out, out of power also. But, uh, but uh, we realize that uh, there's always more that needs to be done. We're very sympathetic to Nova Scotians. There are other programs through the Red Cross and other things that Nova Scotians can access to. So uh, we would encourage them to go see the Red Cross. There's been an enormous amount of fundraising done across the nation, really, and we're very grateful for the, the generosity of the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Residents of a Metro Regional Housing Authority building in Dartmouth wrote to our caucus in the wake of Hurricane Fiona. They pointed out a long list of failures. The building's generator only had a quarter tank of fuel before the storm hit. The common areas with power were not large enough to heat kettles for food, recharge mobility chairs or hospital beds. People did not have power for medical devices in their rooms. Keys for the main door and side door did not work. And the life and safety book that paramedics used in the lobby was out of date, and I'll table that. Mr. Speaker, the minister has a responsibility to keep residents safe. How was this allowed to happen? The Honourable Minister responsible for EMO. Uh, I'd like to thank the member for the question and acknowledge that yes, there were some cha there were challenges, definitely not only in that building, but we had a uh, I, and I don't have the number offhand, but I can provide that in a, a certainly by tomorrow, I'm sure, a, a number of generators that failed uh, in certain circumstances for one reason or another, and their their machines, and sometimes there's trouble with the fuel or whatever. There's always reasons these things fail, but it's something that we're very concerned about. We're very, we're looking at and we're reviewing our procedures, and I appreciate the member bringing it to our attention. It is an area of concern for us, yes. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to say it wasn't just generators, it was, it was a number of failures that were noted as well. I want to share another story about the serious lack of emergency support at housing. A resident fell during the storm. He had no telephone service and lay in his apartment until Saturday afternoon. A neighbour who did have service called MRHA's emergency line, who refused to have the on-call property manager come with the master key to open the door for paramedics. The police had to come and break into the building 
nursing so that he could be taken to hospital, where he passed away shortly after. Mr. Speaker, in the words of the person who brought this to our attention, by not addressing this issue in a logical manner, they have endangered the vulnerable. Mr. Speaker, extreme storms are not going away. Will the minister assure Nova Scotians that this will not be allowed to happen again? The Honourable Minister responsible for EMO. So, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and I'll say to the member that I'm not aware of that uh, particular situation, but I offer my sympathy to the family of that individual and the residents that live around them. And this is uh, something, again, that in the aftermath of, of the storm that we are very interested in in having that type of feedback. And we will, we will try to look at the underlying causes and address those issues. So, thank you. The Honourable Member for Preston. I commend the government for rolling out a $150 payment for some of the most vulnerable, including individuals on income assistance, as well as providing some funding to food banks. However, at the same time, $150 does not go far enough, and food banks are seeing a huge spike in usage. Now food banks are worried they won't be able to feed the many Nova Scotians who rely on them and that are hungry. Crisis exposes those who are most vulnerable. Low-income Nova Scotians have been saying they are scared to death, and I'll table that. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Finance. Is this government prepared to undertake further action to help vulnerable, low-income Nova Scotians make it through the fall? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. Our department has invested hundreds of thousands of dollars during Fiona. Um, we want to remind people that anyone can apply for the $100 for food, but our income assistant uh, clients also get the $150. And um, the other thing I want to remind everyone, that this government has invested over $40 million. Um, hundreds of thousands of dollars have gone to the Red Cross, the United Way, the Salvation Army. There, and, and again, we have invested in a number of food banks. The School Plus programs have received money as well. Um, so if you are aware of a specific food bank or somewhere that needs assistance, I would be happy to, to discuss that question. with you. Mr. Speaker, we need to make sure that we're protecting our most vulnerable populations in this province when it comes, province when it comes to emergency preparedness, including those Nova Scotians living in long-term care facilities. We have heard from long-term care facilities that they were without power for extended periods following Hurricane Fiona, and where facilities with generators had failures. Mr. Speaker, my question, the Deputy Minister for Seniors and Long-Term Care has said they will review the situation, and I'll table this quote. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Seniors and Long-Term Care commit to the House that this review will make certain that long-term care facilities going forward will have full-functioning backup generators? The Honourable Minister for Seniors and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. I can assure the member that all of our long-term care facilities have fully functioning generators. There was one facility that had a temporary interference with the uh, power, and it was restored very quickly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Uh, Mr. P uh, Mr. Speaker, people in Spryfield have been severely affected by Hurricane Fiona. Uh, an apartment on Foxwood Terrace in Spryfield lost its roof and was flooded, displacing many people and families who were then put into hotels. Affordable housing is hard enough to find in this province and some say impossible. We, now we are trying to find urgent housing solutions for those displaced due to Fiona. I'd like to ask the Minister, are they aware of the situation and what actions are they taking to address the situation now? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And to the member, we are very well aware of this situation. For those that are on income assistance and anyone that has signed up with the Red Cross are, be, are placed now in hotels. There will be extension for those um, as long as they need it in order until we find them permanent housing. We know that everyone um, does much better when they're in an environment where it's safe and warm. And uh, please know that we are looking after these individuals and are working day and night to find them a permanent solution to housing. Thank you. 
The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Well, I appreciate the Minister for Community Services answering the question. It isn't just people on income assistance, it's seniors uh, that are uh, getting CPP, it's low-income families. There's a family, a working family of five that's in a hotel. And, and while I appreciate the Minister also saying that uh, they're, they're extending it, uh, I spoke to a family today who, do, who get income assistance who were told uh, that they had to be out by Friday. Um, so I, if, if the minister disagrees with that, I would advise her to have her people uh, reach out to them. The other thing that we've been told is that no housing navigators have had the conversation with those individuals. I've spoken to them several times. My CA has spoken to them several, several times. We've not seen a housing uh, navigator there. So I'd like to ask, uh, will this government find permanent housing for those individuals, not just those on income assistance, but those uh, on seniors on CPP, those with disabilities, and those working class families, and when can they expect it, and can we get a firm commitment here today that nobody, no matter their financial situation, will be removed from a hotel without okay. permanent housing? Order. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you so much. Um, so first of all, our navigators have been in touch. Um, just before I entered this chamber, I was in um, speaking to one of my executive directors to get the latest update, which assured me that um, there is um, an issue happening where people think that they have to be out this Sunday. They do not have to be out this Sunday. We will extend that and we will continue to make sure they are housed, regardless if they're on income assistance or not, we will assure that they, as long as they're signed up with the Red Cross, we will ensure that they will have a warm place to stay. And we will continue working with the Department of Housing to find a more permanent solution. Thank you. Yeah. Member for Annapolis. Nova Scotia's forestry sector has also been hit by Fiona. Our caucus has met with representatives from the forestry industry. They're looking for ways for post-storm cleanup and to return those woodlots to productive use. Aid packages could be deployed to compensate for lost productive value of lots if owners undertake the cleanup, and this serves both purposes. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Natural Resources commit to help woodlot owners affected by the hurricane? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables. Thank you very much, and uh, thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, the hurricane certainly did impact our forestry sector widely throughout Nova Scotia. It, uh, it took a wide swath. And, uh, and on day one, we had staff out uh, observing Crown land. We had staff out observing private lands. And we continue to do that. And uh, as, as much investigation as we can, can do into that, that, that investigation is still ongoing. We've had st talks with uh, stakeholders uh, several times a day, different areas of the province. Uh, we are working on a plan that will both uh, uh, see assistance on private land as well as Crown land. Uh, this is merchantable wood that's laying on the ground right now. This is important to Nova Scotians. It's important to those property owners. It's important to this, uh, get this government as well. The Honourable Member for Annapolis. I want to thank the Minister for that response. Mr. Speaker, we know that farms have also been hit by hurricane. Uh, coming up this time of year, crops and harvests have been affected. Farms that are already been struggling through everything else have been th had this thrown at them and are now dealing with devastating losses. So much damage that Haveracre Farms in Antigonish said they're facing generational loss. I'll table that. Mr. Speaker, will this government commit to specific financial aid for Nova Scotia's agriculture sector? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. I, I, I visited these farms. I visited farms uh, in Antigonish, uh, Guysboro, in Throat, Cape Breton, Picto, um, Cumberland. Um, I've heard those concerns directly. My direction to staff, find ways to help our agricultural sector and do it quickly and do it simply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pear. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour, Skills and Immigration. Earlier this year, inflation hit a 40-year record high of 8.1%, and Nova Scotians are feeling the impact of the cost of living continues to rise and paychecks struggle to keep up. The 2024 plan for a minimum wage increase of $15 is too far off for, to help families who are struggling today. 
Despite knowing this, the Premier stated in June that the government would not look into ex expediting the increase to a $15 an hour minimum wage. I'll table that. Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain how she expects the province's 31,000 minimum wage workers to make ends meet? The Honourable Minister of Labour, Skills and Immigration. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for this important question. We know that this is a very challenging time for many Nova Scotians, and it is a complex situation that everyone finds themselves in. But we also know that the minimum wage is part of that solution. We are on a pathway for $15 an hour, and I know that the, the, the everyone in the House will also know that that committee also had a vacancy. So we have been very clear. We want to be able to hear from employers and businesses because this impacts everyone. So that balanced approach to be able to say we've got a recommendation coming forward well we accepted that one a report will be brought forward by the end of the year and we look forward to the work that the committee is going to bring forward the honorable member for cape Breton center whitney pierre i'll say 15 dollars is too far away nova scotia nova scotia now has the lowest minimum wage among the maritime provinces and the eventual goal of 15 dollars an hour is no longer adequate to help nova scotians keep up with the rising costs Current calculations of a living wage are at a high as $23.50 per hour in the Halifax region. Following this week's announcement, the government has acknowledged that the early childhood educators deserve to make more. Absolutely. We saw similar wage increases for continuing care assistance earlier this year. Can the minister explain why she believes that other hardworking Nova Scotians should be making almost $10 an hour less than a living wage right now? The Honourable Minister for Labour, Skills and Immigration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, the Minimum Wage Review Committee has a really important role, and we've heard from those committee members that they have the challenging, the difficult conversations in bringing forward the perspectives and ideas from businesses and employees, because again, we know that this impacts all Nova Scotians. But we also have to thank businesses, Mr. Speaker, who have gone above and beyond in providing wages, competitive wages for their workers. So we thank those businesses for doing what they've done. The Minimum Wage Review Committee will be meeting. They already have met once, they're going to be meeting again, and we look forward to the recommendations that they bring forward to bring that balanced approach for us to be advised by. The Honourable Member for Clare. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture said in a statement that they were considering what funding packages would be available in order to provide some support to the fishing industry, and I will table that. We know how important this industry is to our economy and how limited the fishing season currently is. Can the minister provide an update to the House on what specific Fiona aid is coming for the industry, and when can we expect to hear more? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member from Clare. Certainly, we are continuing to work with ACOA. We mentioned $300 million, and that is for Atlantic Canadians. We need to be able to focus more on that. I have my departmental staff working with the vice president of ACOA here. They met as, uh, well, last Friday they were meeting. During the storm, what happened was it hit Nova Scotia at 3 a.m. I was up and texting with my Atlantic Canadian ministers, counterparts, shortly after that to look at what the damage was and what we needed to do. Shortly after that, we met with the Parliamentary Secretary of DFO and uh, Canadian Coast Guard, as well as the Minister, Joyce Murray, for DFO the to see what Claire. we could do. Mr. Speaker, the Hurricane, Hurricane Fiona unleashed an unprecedented storm surge on the parts of Nova Scotia. I'll just ask the question. The federal government aid package mentions that small craft harbors are eligible for funding. Can the Minister of Agriculture detail the mechanisms by which these wars can receive, receive help for repairs? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I would be happy to go to that in more detail, either with my next question or order, outside. Please. Order, you. please. The time for oral questions put to members has expired. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I do rise on a point of order. I just want to bring uh, the attention of yourself and the clerks to uh, two statements that were issued from the Premier's office. 
in relation to uh, the chair position. Uh, one that stated the Premier's office was considering the Speaker's position in uh, its succession planning. And another one that was released today uh, stating that there were a number of changes happening, including a resignation of yourself in April and uh, the appointment of three additional deputy uh, speakers to the chamber. Mr. Speaker, I'm just wondering, considering that these statements came from uh, the Premier's office, uh, two things seem clear to me. One, that uh, it, it does seem overtly that there is uh, Premier influence over legislative decisions. And considering your ruling, it seems that uh, ironically, the Premier is trying to use the fact that he's not supposed to do that to evade questions uh, on the matter. So I would like you to consider this as a point of order, the fact that we are seeing uh, statements come from the, pre the, the Premier's office on this issue. Uh, I do believe that we should be able to ask questions in relation to this matter in the Chamber. Thank you. We will, we will take that uh, under advisement and report back to the, to the meeting later. Okay, uh, recognize the acting government house leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that the house do now rise to meet again tomorrow, Friday, October 14th, between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Government business includes second reading of bills introduced today, Bill 196, Bill 198, and Bill 200. Thank you. The motion is that the house to adjourn and rise again tomorrow morning between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. You have heard the motion. All those in favor, show your consent by saying aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. The House stands adjourned to meet again tomorrow morning at 9 a.m.